Hello everybody, Steve Dolan here once again presenting an introduction to CSS. This is part two, brought to you by youngwebbuilder.com. First off, thank you to those of you who commented and made suggestions for the content of this video. A popular request we had was how to make a menu and how to make something change styles when you interact with it, so I'll be covering that in this video. Before we do, there's more learning we have to do about CSS syntax. In this video, we're going to take the remainder of this plain web page and continue to style it and move into more basic rules you need to know to create effects found in today's websites. So let's get started. In part one of this training, we learn the syntax of how CSS is written and we learn the types of selectors that you can use in order to create rules for styling. That was a nice introduction, however, there's more to it. Now we're going to learn how to select more specific elements within our HTML and we'll also learn how to implement a menu. So let's get started learning about pseudo classes. A CSS pseudo class is a keyword that's added to selectors that specifies a special state of the element to be selected. So for example, hover would apply to a style when the users hover over a specified element. Pseudo classes let you apply a style to an element not only in relation to the content of the document, but also in relation to external factors like the history of the navigator. So visited is a good example and we'll explore that later on. The status of the content, like checked, on some form elements, or the position of the mouse, like hover, which lets you know if the mouse is over an element or not. By the way, I'm going pretty fast with things like properties and elements. It's on purpose. It'd be pretty much impossible for you to remember all the special properties I've been using and will use in this video. It's such a broad area of CSS, I simply wouldn't be able to cover it all, especially in an introduction. Uh, I've included some links for resources and the article down below, so you can investigate on your own what properties and values that apply to each selector and sort of play around with it on your own time. Here's the proper CSS syntax to apply to a pseudo class. All you do is add a colon and the keyword to the selector. Most of the syntax is familiar to you from part one of this training. All we did is add on the colon and the red, what's in red here in the syntax. Everything else was covered in the last video. So this is an example of true CSS that includes a pseudo class. This rule says whenever a user hovers over an anchor tag, that's a link, then it's going to turn green. Another thing I want to point out to you is hierarchy or relationships for CSS and making selections based on relationships between elements. So let me tell you what I mean by that. The more important vocabulary you need to know has to do with parent elements um, and child elements. And you'll also hear me refer to ancestor and descendant. I'm going to explain what all this means once we get to some code. But this is some vocabulary that you'll hear over your CSS career and you'll hear me go over this video. I want you to make sure that you understand what's going on. If you're following web standards, you properly indent your code like this example. There's another reason other than writing clean code that web designers code this way, so that you can properly identify child elements. Now the most adult tag in this document is the HTML tag. That's where everything starts. Everything else of the HTML tag is a child. The H1 element here is a child of the body element. If we write a span element, inside the HTML tag, then the span element will be a child of the H1 element. Span would be descendant of the body element. H1 is a direct child of the body element. M, down here for emphasis, M is a child of the paragraph element because it's located inside of the P tag. But is M a child of the H1 element? No, because paragraph is not nested within the h1 tag. They are instead siblings. They both are separate elements not nested within each other but both live within the body tag so they are on the same level. That's why indenting is so important so that you can see that things are on the same level here. So since the span element is within the HTML tag it would be a good idea to indent it so that you can tell that it is a child. So that's another important reason that you should be indenting your HTML code. I'm going to delete this span since that was just for an example and we don't need it. Let's write the beginnings of our menu to further understand this concept. So let's take a look at an example first. If you take a look at youngwebbuilder.com, up here you'll see the navigation. This is a list of navigation links. We're going to try and replicate, we're not going to do this entire menu, but we're going to try and replicate this effect. So it's a list, everything's side by side, and it has some interaction when you hover over it. 
Now I gave you a hint there when I gave you that example, and I told you that it was a list of navigation elements. So that's exactly what we're going to create within our HTML, is an unordered list. Okay, so we have a beginnings of our list. We have unordered list and then a list item here. I'm going to put an anchor tag inside of it. And because we don't have a link yet, I'm just going to tell the anchor tag to go nowhere, close it out with a pound sign. And then we're going to name the link something like home. So this is our example right here. What we're going to do now is copy and paste this a couple of different times so that we have a couple of different menu items. Some standards are maybe an about page, maybe a links page, and a contact page. So these elements are customizable, of course. I want to properly indent it so that we can tell that it's a child of the body tag. By the way, we're paying attention here, the li element is a child of the ul element. And similarly, the anchor element here is a child of the list element, but it is also a descendant of the ul element. So there's that descendant word. Descendant refers to it belonging under a certain group of elements. So and this anchor tag would be a descendant of the UL tag, but it's not directly underneath it. It is directly underneath the list item. So it's a child of the list, but a descendant of the UL tag. So if I save here, we start to see the beginnings of our menu. Now that looks nothing like what we saw on youngwebbuilder.com, but we're going to fix that with CSS. Okay, the first thing that we need to do is identify that this is the menu that we're going to do. So we're going to write a class and call it something semantic like menu so that we understand what it is. Then we need to write the corresponding CSS to target this menu. So we'll create a CSS class selector called a menu since that's what we named it. And what's different here is we need to target the list items within this menu. So what we're, what we're doing here is we're saying the class of menu and all the list items within it. Open and close brackets and then we're going to write display is inline and close out that tag. And when we save it, watch what happens up here. It goes directly in line. And it also gets rid of the bullet points. So immediately, we're starting to take shape here. This display inline rule is very helpful when you're creating menu items. Now let's try to style these links a little bit more appropriately, because right now it's blue and you can't really tell other than the mouse changing the cursor that um, you're going to interact with this link. We're going to create another rule targeting menu and all the anchor tags within that menu open and close the brackets and we're going to write a rule that says text decoration none. What that's going to do is get rid of the line that's underneath these links. So again we're targeting just the anchor tags that are within this menu class. There were other links here. If I make this uh, this line right here, you were looking at an example of CSS in action. If I make that a link You can see that, sure, it's blue, just like these links, but I told the text decoration of none, so these do not have the underline, but this does, because this link is not within the class of menu. Let's go a little bit further here and add some padding. So we'll say padding to the right of these things, and we'll give it a nice nice buffer of 15, 15 pixels and save it. So now there, there's some more room there. We can even go up to 35, just fill up the room here a little bit. So now they're spaced out. Now, what I told it was on the right of all of these anchor tags to have a padding. So even this one, even though you can't see it, there's actually a padding here. Okay, so now they're a little bit more spaced out. So now let's play with a pseudo class. What I want to do is change the appearance or the styling of these links when you hover over them to give the user a better idea that this is a link that you can interact with and something's going to happen when you click it. We're targeting menu and we're going to target the anchor tags, but then this is a pseudo class, so we're going to add colon hover, because we want an interaction when the mouse hovers over this anchor tag. Open and close the bracket, and then we'll give it a text, let's see, we'll give it um, a text decoration of underline now. We'll bring the underline back once they hover over it, and we'll also, we'll give it a color. So a color of something really obvious here. And we'll save that. So now, when I hover over here, 
the link turns red and we get that hover line back. So that is a hover pseudo class element. Another thing we might do is create a rule similar to this one. So I'll copy it. And instead of hover, what I'm going to do is show a visited. I'm going to write the styling information for what to show once the user has already clicked on a link in my site. So an example here is for Google's search results. All links here in blue are websites that I haven't been to yet. But the one in purple here is a web page that I have visited. So that is communicating to me that I've already been there. So it's a different color. So that's what we're going to write. That's an example here. Since I just copied the hover, our styling information is the same. We want to di differentiate these. Uh, by the way, this is just a simple usability thing to figure out. Do you or don't you want to differentiate the visited links for the users of your site or not? What I recommend is actually taking a look at the article that I wrote on youngwebbuilder.com. This is a psychology and web design article. It has some simple usability tips here once you're trying to design your site. For me, since this is just a small site, I want the visited links to be the same color as the non-visited link. So this rule says we'll have the same styling as the hover, but this is not necessary to actually have two rules that say the exact same thing. What we can do here instead is just copy this selector, we'll do a comma, and add it to this one. So all menu, menu classes and visited anchor links will also share these properties. So now all I need to do is just delete this entirely because these properties, this styling information is being shared by both of these selectors. So you can combine CSS selectors. If you do want different styling, maybe you have a large site and you do want to communicate to visitors that they have been to the links on your website before, the pages on your website before, then you would write a separate rule using this selector. One other thing I want to cover is how you can display an image in the background when you hover. You can display an image or just a plain color. So we'll start with just a plain background co color on hover, but first we have to create a selector. We're going to target the menu class, and what we're trying to do is create a hover for these menu items right here. So we're going to target the list and all anchor items within the list. We're going to say on hover, we're going to create a rule for these. So that's the, that's the selector that we're making here. And we want it to be a background color, so we'll just change background color to something like a gray. Close that out. So now when we hover over these areas, all the links information will have a hover with a background color of that gray that I specified. This can be anything. Maybe change it to sienna, something similar. So it really can be a, any color that you like. So that's simply how you display a background color. Now if we want an image, we'll delete this color part and leave it as background. We're going to delete this value and instead we're going to write a URL. So URL and specify this inside just simple parentheses. Inside the parentheses is the URL path to the image you want to show when the user hovers over. So in my case, it's in a screenshots folder and it's called bg.png and I'm going to give that a value of no repeat. So now when we hover over, we can see that there's a background image. I'll actually show that image to you. It looks just like this. It's a little explosive background thing, just a simple image that I created for the purposes of this video. So now when we hover, we can see that that explosive background image appears. So that is the difference between a solid background and an image for a background. Finally, I want to cover three ways that are available for us to tell our HTML document to use the CSS that we write. There's an external style sheet, an internal style sheet, and what's called an inline style. We've been using an internal style sheet for the purposes of this training. That's when the CSS lives within the head tag on each specific individual HTML page. I'll tell you in a second why that might be useful. Now I'll show you the most commonly used practice, and that's an external style sheet. This means that we're going to move all of these rules to a separate file that's specifically for CSS. So what I'm going to do here is highlight just the CSS that we wrote here, create a new file and name it styles.css, and now this is a blank document. By the way, you can do this just with a regular text editor. You'll just need to name it .css, and then we're going to paste our code that we wrote in there. And we can get rid of the indents if you want. 
We'll save that file. So now it's an external style sheet. It is specifically a .css file that we're going to reference within Sardar HTML. Now that we did that, we can delete this. And we actually don't need these style tags anymore either. Instead, inside of the head tag, this is the important part, we're going to create a link and we're going to reference it as a style sheet. We're going to give it a type of text and CSS. Then we're going to tell the CSS where to find it using href, styles.css, and then close out that tag. It's important that you get this URL path right. For me, it's just styles.css because it is located in the same root as the HTML. The files are side by side, they're not in separate folders. So that is how you do an external style sheet. Multiple external style sheets can be referenced inside this single HTML document. You don't have to use just one. You can put many of them here. Now an inline style loses many of the advantages of style sheets by mixing content with presentation. You really want to be careful by using this method. You really want to use it sparingly. Try to avoid it, actually. To use inline styles, you use the style attribute inside the relevant HTML tag. So we'll use this h2 tag here for as an example. And we use the style attribute inside the HTML tag, and this is where we write the properties and values. So we're going to say style color colon is going to be red, and we'll close that out. And when we save it, we'll see that immediately the h2 tag here becomes red. So that is an inline style. You put the styling information directly within the HTML tag itself. So what style will be used when there is more than one style specified for an HTML element? Well, in the beginning, the first part of this training series, I told you that we'd get to the cascading part of CSS a little bit later. So this is where that comes in. So here's how it works. Generally speaking, we can say that all styles will cascade into a virtual style sheet by the following rules. The lowest priority is the browser's default. Every browser has their own built-in default values for HTML elements. You'll need to check the browser developer's websites to find those out, or you can just ignore them and write your own, which is what everybody else does anyway. So we have the browser as the default. That's the lowest priority. That's what the browser will look at last. Then we move into an external style sheet. From there, an internal style sheet. That's what goes in the head section. So an inline style. That's what goes inside of the HTML element, has the highest priority. That means that it will override a style defined inside the head tag or in an external style sheet, and also the browser. It overrides all of these above it. Now I have the star here next to inline style because there's a tricky note here. If the link to the external style sheet is placed after the internal style sheet inside the head of the HTML document, then the external style sheet will override the internal style sheet. So I'll say that one more time. If the link to the external style sheet is placed after the internal style sheet inside the HTML, then the external style sheet will override the internal style sheet. So that's tricky information there. Well, thank you for watching, everybody. I hope that this training series is giving you a really nice head start to starting your CSS career. Thank you for watching.